Hi, everybody. As you know, Hounds of Love is one of my favorite records, and it has been absolutely incredible that, due to Stranger Things, that Running Up That Hill got this massive second, third, fourth lease of life, and, and it's now become one of the biggest songs in the world. We just heard when we were filming this, for instance, that it is the number one streamed song in the world today. Obviously, by the time you watch this, it might not be number one anymore, but the point is that it became the number one streamed song in the world is incredible. Stuart Elliott was the drummer who played on that album. He also was pretty much on every Kate Bush record, right from the beginning of A Kick Inside. So it is my great pleasure to be able to talk to Stuart Elliott, who is not only the drummer on so many Kate Bush tracks, but also was the original drummer in A Cockney Rebel. Steve Harley and the Cockney Rebel. I wonder if you all remember that. Absolutely incredible band. A band that traversed between 70s kind of glam rock and new wave. A band that really, really sums up the 70s in such a positive way for British music. And his resume is insane. He's played with Paul McCartney. He's played with the Alan Parsons Project. He's played with everybody. Roger Daltrey. You name it. A wonderful guy, a wonderful talent. So let's talk to Mr. Stuart Elliott. So what is your memories of coming down and playing on Hounds of Love? It's, it was such a, a long, protracted um, bunch of sessions for, for that album. Not just, you know, not just the drum, the drum parts, but um, you can see, you know, when you listen to the album, you see how much work went into it. So it was, it was a colossal amount of time was spent on it. Um, I, do, I do recall... Um, Sort of, uh, you know, when Kate sort of presented a song, that it was, it was, it was very wasn't complete, but it was, it was complete enough to perform to, which, which is it's half the battle really, because if it's just like a, a click track, and a, a, a pad, you know, like we used to do in the eighties, put a pad down, oh, now we start doing building it up. It was never like that, and she always had a full vocal as well, full vocal, which is the most important thing for me. So, you know, as long as you've got, you've got that, that performance on the vocal, which she, she does that in her own time, and then you've got something to play to. I actually prefer doing it live, um, but that's not the way it works. There was one track we did live, I think it was Rocket's Tale. Um, it was just me and Kate. She was playing keyboards, she was in the studio with me, and I was thrashing the drums. It's a big sort of drum thing at the end. Um, so it was a mixture of a mixture of performance uh, modes for that album. But it's so it was so um, so varied. I've never worked on on an album that's demanded like a different drum sound for absolutely every every song. We go Incredible. Room. She had like a she had a stone room. She had a wood room, and there was a little tiny little dead room at the end where I think we did. Um, I've done cloud busting there, just the sort of snare, the military snare, and everything dry. Sounds like a linjum, but it isn't. <laughs> um, so it was. It was. It was a real. It was a real period of exploration. With running up that hill, um, you added live drums to the Lin drum part, the tom part, to just make it feel more natural. Yeah, 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 yeah. We, we uh, eliminated completely the the bass, the kick, and the snare from the Lin. I think we kept kept the the Lin toms and sort of did something to make them sound less less rigid. Um, and then, I think it was a few days later, actually, I, I did, 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 did the, the fills in the middle eight, which was my Simmons SDS-7, as I recall. Great. And massive, massive reverb on it. It sounded like a, an explosion. Oh, no, the SDS-7 had, um, it had these little microchips in it, um, EPROMs, they were called. So you, it was blown in, a, a sample was blown into this thing, EPROM with legs, put it in the module, play it and then uh, I think one of them had an explosion like thunder or something so I, I had one of the pads was like the, the explosion and the other one was was the was was the Simmons toms so that's how we got the fills at the end but other than that it's, it's a pretty stripped down track when Hounds of Love came out for instance I mean that was so massive in the UK but didn't really resonate at all I mean, Kate never really has resonated in in the US like like you would expect her to so it's crazy to see the stranger things that just explode. I think at the time it came out, it was 37 years ago. Um, the American market was, it was all kind of like, 
gung-ho for guitar rock, wasn't it, really? It was Bon Jovi and all that kind of thing, 80s rock. Yeah. So Kate's sort of kind of darker and more melodic side of things, probably not quite what they were after. No. But having said that, I think um, uh, Running Up That Hill is quite a contemporary sounding piece now. Oh, ridiculous, yeah. So uh, it's obviously caught, you know, I think the I think the the, the music taste musical taste in America has changed, uh, especially with the youth. It's very different now to what it was. Um, so it's just yeah, it's the final chance that it got. In fact, I've just I don't know whether you know, but um, it's it's Billboard Global number one right now. Um, don't think it means that it's the number one position in every country. I think it means that yeah, uh, I understand everything in the world is kind of like being listened to the most. I was living in Carlisle, and I was a teenager, and I was in a band. And the record came out, and I think I listened to like, you know, you remember when you used to do this, I listened to side one probably for two weeks before I turned it over. And just like obsessed about side one, and then I turned it over, and then for two weeks listened to side two, and then you go back to side one, and you're like, oh, I forgot how good this was. You know, it was just... Yeah, yeah. Those were the days. Well, those were the days when you had side one and side two, weren't they? Yeah. Um, which is, it's a kind of a sad loss, really, because I remember some of my favourite albums... There was a whole atmosphere on one side and a different atmosphere on the other side, and that's very much what Hounds of Love is like. Because the, the side two, side two is the more sort of uh, mellow kind of. Uh, What's well, incredible, actually? It's, you know, the Bulgarian. The ninth wave, yeah, the ninth wave. It's all sort oh, of yeah, yeah. It's an amazing piece of music. Uh, even you know, there's not a lot of drums in the second side, is it? But uh, yeah. <laughs> so did you play? Did you do the Tom overdubs then on Running Up That Hill? Is that is that you? Every track I ever did with Kate um, since she became producer, they're all done to a click. Um, and there was quite often some sort of fair light pattern that Del Palmer, her engineer and bass player, used to sort of get the track started. I think that was a Lin drum that was placed on that. And I, it was my job to sort of replace bits and add sort of Simmons fills over the top. I think, I, if I recall rightly, I think the Tom's, Tom's, the, the, the Lin drum Tom's. I yep. think I, I overdubbed some stuff under them as well to sort of loosen them up a bit. We played it in bits. It's not, I mean, I can play the pattern as a whole pattern, but it didn't, yep. didn't materialise by the time I, I'd sort of sussed it. It was like all different elements to it. But in fact, I did it live with Kate and um, David Gilmore. There's a live performance of that. So I just did everything and I did the, uh, the Simmons bills were. Um, Is that with Tony Franklin? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Do Tony's you know, a good. Tony's a very good friend of mine, and he he reposted that video. It's just fantastic. So yeah. good. Yeah, yeah, I love that video. Yeah. I wish I still had that um, little trigger thing. I, I got this guy to make me uh, – I, I used to – I had an Akai S3000, and I got this guy to make me some triggers, get some little piezo discs, and he made this little interface box that reduced the sensitivity of them. So that they would, if I if I put it uh, if I taped it onto the rim of the drum, I could play the drum and it wouldn't trigger. But if I hit the rim, you get this whatever you wanted. So I used to have, I used to, when I used to work in the studio, then I used to put all these triggers on the rims and with percussion and stuff. And in this case, uh, it was like uh, Simmons Tom with explosions on them. So it was like everything was out. I I, I, I imagine that whoever watches that uh, that um, video will probably. Think, I was just miming because those things just hitting the rims there. There's no, <laughs> those explosions are going off, but it was it was all live. So obviously you 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 played with Kate right from the get go. You're on the you're on the first album. First album, yeah. Yeah. How did it all come about? I used to be in Cockney Rebel, as you probably know, Steve Harley, Cockney Rebel. Um, yeah. The first album we did, Andrew Powell, who is who was Kate Kate's producer on those first two albums, did the string arrangements or the orchestra arrangements. And then the second album, we um, uh, Alan Parsons came in to produce or co-produce with Steve Harley, and Andrew Powell was brought in again. So that's what started a little network, a little family network, where um, Andrew got the job of producing Kick Inside, and he just asked me to do it, because um, we'd worked together, he liked, liked my playing. Um, and he liked, also liked another band that, that Alan was producing called Pilot. So we got Ian Benson, David Payton, guitar and bass. They were on the cable sessions as well. Oh, actually, also Duncan McKay, who was in um, Cockney Rebel with me. 
So it was it was basically Cockney Rebel and Pilot that were the, the musicians on, on that album. But actually, we went on as a as a sort of family network to do loads of stuff together. Do all the Alan Parsons projects as well. Anything that uh, in fact, I speak to Andrew Powell every every, uh, every week. You know, I think for us, red blooded uh, Englishman. I mean, she was everything. I mean, she was so she was so insanely talented, or is so insanely talented. Um, on all levels. I know that Hugh said when she came down and sung on Gabriel 3, Melt, as the Americans call it, everybody was just besotted with her on all levels, like how stupidly talented she was and just her whole presence. Yeah, she she is. She would, she blew us away then, you know, as a, as a young young kid. Mind you, we were all kids as well. I mean, I was only sort of, she was 19, I think I was 24 at the time. You were the, you were the elder statesman of rock. We were, yeah, we were, but uh, <laughs> this, this little sort of hippie chick came in and just sat behind the piano, started yeah. playing and singing. That was the that was what's so good about doing that, that first album with her. Yeah, that she was in the in the in the studio with us, playing a piano and singing. So wow. it was made the job a lot easier. You just all you have to do is just play along with her. Was the whole song completed, or were you just getting in there to play parts? How how was the process? Running up the hill, uh, she sent me a cassette demo actually to start off, which is, she's never done before and never never did since. And it was called Deal with God then, right? That, that was the working title. And the thin pattern was there. It was the pattern there. I don't remember exactly how produced it was. I think it was fairly sparsely produced. It was just a sort of, it was a, an arrangement of the song, which she always she always has. Um, she doesn't rearrange songs while we're in the studio. She gets it right to her satisfaction, and that's the way it kind of stays. And as you probably know, her, her, her arrangements are quite compli- com- complicated. There's un- Every moment in her songs is always not what you'd expect. Yeah. N- never, just never. It's never the amount of bars you'd expect and the beats you'd expect. That's <laughs> <laughs> Wuthering Heights, you know, five, you know, five, four verses. Yeah. Two, two bars of five and a bar of four or something like that. But it's uh, she wouldn't have written in five four. Yep. It's, she, it's, it's, it's dominated by her, her lyrics. She's got a lyrical idea. That's how long it is. It just turns out that it's a five four bar because it's a, you know it's a complete lyric. So there we go. Very John Lennon as well. You think of uh, yeah. across the universe how yeah. he would just do the end of like each uh, pre-chorus before going into the chorus. One, one I think is two, four, one's a three, four, one's a four, four, one's a That's five, four. Right. So like yeah. whatever works. Absolutely. Yeah. The Beatles did a lot of that. I, I, was, in fact, I was listening just the other day to um, Don't Let Me Down. That's the same thing. Nobody ever loved you like a fourth. So one, two, three, four. That's a five as well. So by the time you've done Hounds of Love, you've played with her on every record. Yeah, I've, I've played on every record. I didn't play on every track, though. Right, right. But you, I mean, obviously you must have connected so well on that first record that she kept giving you a call and bringing you back in. Oh, yeah, eventually, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, Kate, Kate's very, um, she always kind of wanted to choose the right musicians for whatever the song was. Um, right. It's, it's kind of... Uh, I don't know, it just, it just kind of worked out the way it did. Kate quite often had a, she had her own band, you know, that they, they hung out together and they smoked dope together and stuff, you know. Um, so they kind of got close, which is what you want in the studio. You want to be with people you're close to. Um, but then a producer would say, that's great. Yeah, this, this tracks are great, but can we get the guys in to do this one or that one or whatever? And it always worked out as a sort of a mix of two teams of people. Right. And later on, it was just, you know, Two two drummers because be one of us at the time in, uh, in the studio. Whereas the first sort of two or three albums were a whole bunch of musicians in the studio. Once so the backing track went down in a it's a live backing track. Um, but you know somewhere along the line, Kate gets what she needs. Um, even on that first album, if you listen, uh, even though she was just a uh, you know she just sat down and played her songs. Once we'd all finished the backing tracks. Oh my God, the stuff she put on after us, the vocals, the layered vocals. And oh my God, it's just, she's got a brother Paddy in to do his Bella Likers and the funny ethnic voices and everything. She was way ahead of it then. How did you get into the Cockney Rebel? Well, that was a complete accident, actually. I was, um, I think I must have been about 18. I think I was 18. 
fact, the first professional gig I ever did was with Adam Faith. You remember he had that hit TV series, Budgie? Yeah, of course. Yeah, well, it was just after that. So he did a, he did a, he did a five-week tour of the working men's clubs. And um, I was in a sort of post- I played working men's clubs. Oh, yeah. Batley, oh, yes. Batley's Variety Club and all that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's soup in a basket, we used to call it. Um, <laughs> And I was in this sort of just amateur local band and the roadie, we actually had a roadie, um, <laughs> he, some, he had some connection and asked with, with, with uh, Adam Faith's lot and uh, he said, do you fancy doing a tour with Adam Faith? I said, yeah, don't I? Um, so he got me down to the um, audition, which I passed, I was 17 at the time, and off we went five weeks, a week in each town. Um, after that, I was just messing about with just local bands. And um, through a friend, there was a bass player that was looking for a drummer. I gave him a call and I asked him if he still needed a drummer. He says, no, I've got a drummer now, but I've got a mate, Steve, who's looking for a drummer. So that's Steve Harley. So it was a complete accident, just total accident. I mean, I, I've said this before, but I don't know how, where I'd be now in the music business if it hadn't been for that break with Steve. I mean, That's we, incredible. Because we just, you know, we were together for a year and then we were with EMI, released an album, and we were having hit singles within a year of, of that, you know. So, oh, it was a really lucky break, actually. And a ton of credibility. I mean, because, you know, he was, he had a kind of a punk rock attitude before punk rock was punk rock. You know, there was just something about him that was just a little edgier than your average kind of mid-70s kind of yeah, British music. Right. It was actually uh, one of the songs. I don't think it ever made the uh, an album. It might have been a B-star. It's called Spaced Out, which was, which was actually in 1973, I think it was, we recorded it. But it's just, it just sounds like punk music. Now, yeah. we're all kids. We're all kids. I mean, it sounds very sort of naive and, and sort of childlike, but... Uh, it was punk, <laughs> without, yeah. Without the horrible lyrics, yeah. I mean, what year was "Make Me Smile" the huge hit? Best years of our lives was "Make Me Smile." "Make Me Smile" um, last year or the year before featured in the Viagra advert. <laughs> Come up and see me and make me smile. <laughs> yeah, but the joke is, you know, the, we're out there, our in joke is that they should have used Mister Soft. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was, it was. It was for about a year. It was the Viagra ad. In fact, it's going to be a BMW ad soon. It's such a great song. It's furniture village, but it gets used a lot. That song. It's yeah. yeah it's got a. It's got a, a whole history of uh, usage behind it. Film, film usage. And yeah. Full Monty used it. It's got a it's got a blend between a seventies kind of feel good feel, you know, with with the, the the layered vocals, but at the same time, same time, it sort of feels a bit new wave as well. It it it's that's what I I think a lot of us love about Cockney Rebel is that it it bridges that gap between new wave and the seventies, the seventies yeah, kind of feel good yeah. music. And I think it's the only the only record that ever had stops like that in it. Right, long right. stop. <laughs> Not yeah. Just <laughs> It's about two, at least two bars. I can't, I haven't counted, I've never counted them, but there were about two, two bar breaks. You know? Now, I've, it says here in my notes that you played on Year of the Cat. Yeah, yeah. In fact, I did that, um, started that in 1975, and it was released in 76, I think. How did that come about? Was that. Um... Alan Parsons, a producer, again. Um, Amazing. He asked, he asked me to do it. In fact, he asked. Uh, it was Cockney Rebel Rhythm Section again. Um, it was George George Ford on bass, me on drums. Um, who was on guitar was Tim Rinnick, Peter Woods on piano, and Peter White on lots of other things. But it was a fantastic band. I've got to tell you that. I, mean, I listen to that album now, and I still still kind of gobsmacked at the playing on it. Yeah. Not, not my playing. I'm talking about Tim Rennick's. <laughs> my God, it, it, it was just, you know, the way it, just all kids, basically. We're all just like 23, 24. Which is crazy because it's such a sophisticated sounding record. You'd think it would be seasoned uh, musicians of, you know, but they multiple were, decades. They were seasoned even at a young age. It was, it was incredible. Um, but again, it was another, um, I think Alan Parsons' touch on it made it more polished, you know, because, you, you know, he... Um, he engineered Dark Side of the Moon. Yeah, yeah. 
So there's that same sort of soft softness to it. You know, you got the, the nice soft bass drum that's that's not too loud in the mix. Snare drums, just I mean, his placement of instruments is just gorgeous, um, and his echoes and uh, reverbs are just beautiful. Uh, yeah, that that's a major part of the polished sound of that album. We just we just kind of like got on with it. It was it was, it was one of those albums that. I mean, I think there's only about four or five albums in my life that I can just say that was an incredible experience from start to finish, and I'm really proud of the result. Kick Inside was one of them. Uh, Alan Parsons' album Pyramid was another one. Year of the Cats, another one. You played on Time Passages as well? Yeah, that, that was beautiful as well, but it didn't have quite the same continuity as um, Year of the Cat for me. Something about you with the cat. You know when you get a bunch of songs um, and an album has a kind of, there's a journey to it. A bit like Abbey Road, The Beatles. You know, I can't listen. I never listen to one track on that album. I always listen to a whole side. Obviously, it was a CD, the whole, the whole album. I, I never shuffle because I just know which one's coming up next. You know, you know when you, you've heard an album so many times, you know what the next song is because it's, it's all part of that journey. Yeah, the cat's like that for me. Time Passages was more like um, uh, just a bunch of songs, really good songs, but it didn't have the same flow to it as, uh, as the Year of the Cat did for me. So your, your career's basically been a balance between touring and, you know, touring and live work and studio work. Yeah, it was, most, it was mostly touring when I was in Cotton Rebel, apart from the albums that we did. Right. But then when... Um, when Steve split the band up in 77, because we, we were only together for like three years, maybe four years, not counting, you know, including the time that we were putting the band together. Yeah, it was mostly touring when I was in Cotton Rebel, but then when we split, I kind of put out the word to all my friends that I'd kind of met, Tim Rennick and a few others. And then it was sessions from then on, and I was building a family as well, I was married with family. Um, so that was that, was that until... Uh, sort of the 80s, sort of late 80s, where Steve started going out again. So I got back in the drum seat with him. And I'm, oh, still, wow. I'm, I'm still in the drum seat with him um, when, I'm, when I'm around him when he wants me. Is he playing much? Yeah, he's out, he's out now. Um, he's, um, doing an, he's, got, he's got an acoustic band as well. So he, he, oh, he does? does. Well, he's been doing this for years, actually. Doing, um, the acoustic show started off as just him and another guitarist. Right. And then it was him, a guitarist and a percussionist. And then it was him, guitarist and keyboard player. But now he's got a quartet, which is sort of an upright bass, a couple of jazzy guys, some gypsy jazz sort of influenced guys. Um, and so it's just, yeah, it's just four of them and a violin, of course. Um, so it's, it's four of them in the acoustic band. But he's been, he's been doing tons of gigs with them. But he's out now. He's, he's, he's out now. He's, He's been the whole of June, and he did half of May just to Christmas. And we're doing some shows in um, December, some rock band shows. That's so cool that he's still playing. Yeah, yeah, he's better than ever. Actually, he's uh, he's doing he's doing really well. He he really knows how to. He's really sort of found himself. He's really relaxed and and at ease with himself on stage. Whereas before it used to be quite tense, and well, we all were. We all, I mean, I, I remember I used to shout at my drum roadie, you know, because well, actually, in those days, drums fell apart on stage. Everything, you know, the swivelmatic, um, <laughs> you know, everything. They were on the stage all the time, tightening things up, and just falling over and everything. And uh, when they were, didn't understand what I was, you know, what was going wrong, I was getting really angry because Steve was always angry. <laughs> so, yeah, ashamed of it now, but. Um, yeah, he's a lot more relaxed now, and I'm, I'm super relaxed when I'm playing now. So there's no. Well, now stuff. the hardware on drums is a, is a lot higher quality. It was in those days. Oh, crumbs! Yeah, oh, everything just used to collapse. Single stools going, <laughs> drum <laughs> bursting open, and all kinds of stuff. Oh, yeah, nice. I remember my my drummer bought an old Premier um, drum kit from the '60s, and all the stands were like. Little tiny skinny kind of symbol. You hit the symbol on the stand. Do this. <laughs> oh, they, they were great for studio work, though. Oh yeah. What was your What's your main kit? What What did you use in the studio back then? Oh, back then, um, 
Well, I started off with a Ludwig standard kit, which I bought when I was a kid. So it's classic window. Classic window. Right. Um, but it wasn't the Lud- it wasn't the classic uh, Ludwig classic, it was the Ludwig standard, which was a cheaper version. It sounded fantastic. It was a brilliant. I, mean, I used that for the first two Cockney Rebel albums. In fact, it inspired me so much. Since I moved to DW, I got a classics version of, see in the corner there, same Ringo kit. Oh, lovely. See, yeah, so I've got, I've got, I've got the, full, the full Ringo kit as a DW classics. Yeah. Who I'm with now. But um, back then, it was, it was that kit. And then after that, Gretsch became all the rage. So I bought bits and pieces of Gretsch drums and I had a bit of round badge, floor tom, square badge, rack toms. And I mixed those with Premier. So sort of, they were all black, so it looked like a proper kit. Shortly after that, I went with Sonor, which I still have the Sonor kit in my studio, still set up permanently. Then I went with Tama. Um, then I went with Remo, used their drums for a while. I'm still with them for the heads. Um, but now I'm a DW, so I've got the classics kit the studio and a performance kit for live. Are you still tracking a lot? Do you have a studio set up? And you... Yeah, yeah. Well, you can see if you look at my um, website, stuartelliot.com, you'll see the studio. I built a studio 20, about 22 years ago down the bottom nice. of the garden. Oh, it's wonderful. It's the best thing I ever did. I wish I'd had the facility when I was, you know, at the, at the, in my heyday, you know, doing sessions and stuff. I could have just developed things so much quicker. I mean, my practice regime in those days was just playing pads and just listening to music all the time. But now I've got the luxury of, you know, being able to actually play real drums whenever I want. You know? So it's, uh, it's a great little space to have. Neil Innes. Yeah. That's pretty cool. In his book of records. Oh, that was a lot of fun. I can imagine. In fact, he, he made an album not that long ago, just before he died. I did, I did offer to sort of uh, do some, some work on it for nothing, you know, but uh, I think they, already, they, were, they were already well catered for. Because he likes doing um, more kind of uh, big band type music, you know, sort of, yeah. sort of croony stuff. Um, and we were, when we did the In His Book of Records, there was quite a few sort of semi sort of disco-y funky pastiche sort of things which were a lot of fun it was great i can imagine john williams traveling oh yeah that was a session i i did uh, for francis monkman who was um the he was the harpsichord player and arranger uh, i only did the one track on there um, oh my god it was, a, it was a nightmare it had um, <laughs> well it was about sort of eight pages long yeah. um and I, I didn't, I've never really been much of a reader, especially just reading lots of melody. Um, so I kind of, and there was a click track, the first time I'd ever had a click track thrown at me. So I was sitting there and uh, Herbie Flowers was on the session, let me face back. Of course, yeah. All the guys, that, all the regular session guys that were brilliant readers and John Williams was there playing his. Um, oh, by the way, you know it's John Williams, the guitarist, not not the. Um, no, I know from Sky. Yeah, yeah. yeah John yeah, yeah. Williams, the classical guitar player. Sky. Yeah, because I'd be obviously Herbie Flowers and Ray Cooper and all that stuff were in Sky. Yeah, so I, yeah. I know what you mean. Don't worry. Uh, Ray Cooper. <laughs> Tristan Fry was in Sky. He was the drummer. Oh, was he? Wasn't Ray Cooper? Oh, Ray Cooper. No. Um, no. So yeah, they threw this track at me. It was about ten minutes long with a yeah. clip, and I just. I just didn't know what to do. So I just, I just, oh, wow. I was just, cause I, I, so I've always just relied on my ears. You know, I listen to something and I react to it, but they could see that I was struggling and I, I wasn't in with the click. And uh, so I had to sit it out. Herbie Flowers kind of got the, got the needle. He said, come on, we have to review this situation. He went into the control room and they, they called me in. So while they were putting the track down to the click, I was, I was clocking it and writing in my own little notes. And then when I went in, I played it and had to drop in here and there where I sort of lost, lost it. But so John Williams loved what I did. Great. Really loved, so I, I invented some parts for it. You know, I didn't just sort of rattle through it like a session player. I kind of put some patterns in it that nobody else probably would have done, sort of African patterns and stuff. You know, so you'd have to listen to it. It's, it's a bit rough and ready, but... <laughs> I'm I going got, to now. I'm I going to. Bit, oh, my God. I was, just so, I was just so stressed out when I got home that night. I just wanted to die. I wanted... You know, I, I don't want. I never want to play the drums again. I've had enough. <laughs> <laughs> but 
But that's it's, what you know, that's, that's what sessions are like, you know, especially formal sessions like that. They can yeah. either be a joy or a complete nightmare. So, you know, I kind of I was glad that that sort of session kind of stopped coming in for me, uh, and, and in favour of just doing albums with good artists and stuff, where you sort of you settle in and then you start getting creative, which is. So you played on "Give My Regards to Broad Street," Paul McCartney. Yeah, the hit single. Yeah, yeah. Well, that that was actually um, that was a fixer that got me that gig. You know, fixers to organise orchestras and stuff. Yeah, yeah. He just called me. He says, "Oh, would you? Would you like? Um, are you available for a session at uh, Air London Studios and wherever it was? And three hours or six hours or something? Oh, yes, fine. Yeah, yeah. Who was it for? Oh, I was just Paul McCartney. I said, "What?" <laughs> and then I got the demo sent to me which was Paul, a cassette demo of Paul singing it around the piano with George and George was singing bits of it and um, then on the B side there was a version of it with Paul playing drums so I rocked up to the studio and again it was Herbie Flowers on bass and Dudley from Art of Noise on keyboards Paul's on piano um, and we just rattled it off and uh, Everyone was delighted with that, but um, that's less of a formal session because it was a really, really good song. It's, I've always found it really easy to play really good songs. Sure. You know, when something is, is, is sort of arranged, you know, when they arrange the arse out of a bad song, it doesn't make it any better, you know. It's like... Right. You have to be inspired, you know, so uh, that did the trick. But, um, yeah, that, that was amazing. I walked on air for about three weeks after doing that session. I'm sure. I'm sure there'll be, still be a little bit of walking on there now, just to say that you played with Paul McCartney. I just couldn't believe that I'd been asked and actually got to do it. So I was, you know, as a kid, that's what that's what made me want to be in rock and roll. It was the Beatles first, then the Rolling Stones. Um, you know, then there's Small Faces and Hollies and Hendrix and, you know, but to, to, to imagine that I'd ever work with one of the Beatles when I was a kid, I used to dream about meeting them and going and playing with them. And it's like, well, it's finally happened. In fact, I played, with, played with Ringo as well. I know, I saw that. A live show with Ringo. So, you know, as, as a, I'm still, I'm still over the moon about the Beatles. I mean, that's the thing, the best thing ever, that ever happened. Um, especially with the Abbey Road album. It's just, it's just magic. Just every, Where did you grow up? <laughs> uh, Victoria. Um, Pimlico, Victoria, London. I used to have lunch at home um, from school, you know, I used to go home for lunch. And I'd always go home, go into the, the dad's dad's room where the drums were. My dad was a, dr a drummer in the big bands. So there's drum kits set up in the house so I could, I could play. Amazing. There. So I'd put the gramophone on, put the Beatles on, bash the drums for what time I had left after eating and then back to school. So, yeah, so working with Paul was just, oh, my God. I did a week with him in his studio at um, in Hastings as well. I don't know whether you whether you know, but most of the music business also went down there because Paul was looking for a band. And um, you know, you know the producer Phil Ramone. Of course, yeah, yeah. He uh, it was his job to set up all these sessions in London of just group, just throw bunches of musicians together um, and just play stuff. Um, and we didn't realise it at the time, but what he was doing was he was vetting everybody to then send to Paul's. So I got to go down there. I, don't know, I know Charlie Morgan was down there. Um, um, and just loads of musicians get up down there. In fact, that's why so many musicians use Paul McCartney. Paul McCartney's on their CV because they were down at his studio. Um, but... You know, what came out of that was he did find a band, he got a band together, then, then recorded all those songs properly with them. But it was still another audition, but it was good doing it. Down there for a week. And that was was that after doing uh, Give Our Regards to Broad Street? It was after, actually, yeah. It was about three years after. I think Broad Street was 83, and um, we were down at his studio in 86. You got some Jack Bruce credits. What did you do with, with Jack? Well, Clem Clemson, who... Uh, was a long time sort of player with Jack. He was also on the Roger Daltrey tour. And he asked me, I think they lost their drummer um, to something else or sacked him or something. I don't know. Bruce Gary, I think his name was, American guy. Uh, he used to be in the Knack. Remember the Knack? I do, yes. 
Yeah. Yep. He, he was he was uh, he was Jack's drummer for a while. Uh, he might have gone back to America or something. Like that. But anyway, um, Clem asked me I'd like to play with Jack, so um, I went down to meet him, and we um, set up our gear in the local village hall, and we were rehearsing a couple of songs, and then Jack was facing me, but he was also facing the door, and he just stopped staring at the door. Um, and I turned around, and there was an old lady in a in an apron standing at the door. <laughs> <laughs> and what the hell is all this noise all about? So Jack said, "Oh, I'm sorry, sorry, love. We'll turn it down a bit." Um, but then I, after that, I went to, to, did a few gigs with him in Germany. We just go off and off for the weekend and do do, uh, do you know the sort of beer tents and all that stuff. And then I went back to Germany to do some recording. Then, um, then that was that. That was that. And then the last time I saw him. Was he also played bass on the um, the gig I did with Ringo? He was oh uh, wonderful. Yeah, he was. Um, That's a band. Yeah, it was great actually. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It was the um, Michael Jackson and Friends show in Munich in nineteen ninety three, I think it was. But yeah, that was great. I mean, the high the highlight of that for me was you know one of my favourite fills in the whole world ever is that fill that Ringo does in little help for my friends you know in the break between the the first verse and the second verse yeah yeah <laughs> when i played that i just my all the hairs just stood up on the back of my neck it was just incredible it's just one of those fills that it's sort of it's a drum break but the motion of the song doesn't stop yeah i often thought you know there's a million fills you could do there but that one is the most genius fill that, that, I, well, that I've ever heard. It's like a piece of music, a little piece of music itself, you know. So, yeah, that was, uh, that was a bucket list uh, job for me. So was Ringo your inspiration as a, as a kid to be a drummer? Uh, one of them, yeah. Yeah, one of the first. In fact, well, actually, um, when I grew up as a little kid, my dad, uh, because he was in the big bands, he, he, you know, he listened to a lot of jazz. Um, and amongst that uh, would have been Buddy Rich. Um, he listened to a lot of um, Duke Ellington, which I didn't really care for. Um, but he also listened to a lot of um, the Dave Brubeck Quartet with Joe Morello. And that really captivated me. That, that really, really captured my imagination, Joe's playing. And um, that's just something that stuck with me ever since. Um, so that's where, if there's any jazzy element in me, that's where it comes from. And it, it's just, it's okay. you can't really put your finger on these things, but uh, just something about Joe's playing that sort of, you know, this sort of African flavours and just turn the, turn the, um, turn the snares off and play them with his hands and all kinds of stuff. But um, yeah, he, I think he probably was my first influence. And then it was, um, then it was definitely Ringo. In fact, Ringo is still, still, he still influences me. When I listen to his playing now, I still think, man, that is just so on the money. It's just so All beautiful. about the song. Oh, yeah, totally, totally, totally. But the grooves, the grooves and the fills, man. He, he, I think he single-handedly played more incredible music, you know, fills that were little bits of music in themselves than anyone else ever, really. I'm the walrus. God, it's just, they're just this. In fact, what's that other one? Um, Hello, goodbye. I feel there's Phil's in Hello, goodbye in the middle. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, my God. They're just, and, and Day in the Life, of course, those Phil's in Day in the Life. They're just little, little jewels. In fact, Bill Collins made remarks on them. And he, 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 um, he was quoted as saying that they, they are very complex things. Although this, you might think they're easy, they're very complex, and you can't really successfully copy them. It's just it's the dynamics and the stuff. And then understand. his swing, how he would play his hi hat, like he was, yeah, yeah, like this. Actually, I've started doing that. Uh, really, three years, and I swear to you, um, it makes it, it does make a different feel. I've done it with like sort of disco beats and stuff like that, and uh, house beats, or whatever. Swinging that thing, oh man, it's, it's just, it just feels fantastic. It's, I, I think it's similar to um, you know, drummers that sort of play match grip and the other ones that play traditional. 
there's a different feel because of that the way the stick is in the traditional grip i don't do it but uh same you know it's it, it's it brings out different things in drummers that's why they will switch from one to the other so that's that that swishing thing on the hi-hat is that i do it maybe only do it for a couple of minutes at a time during a whole show but Every time I do it, I think, man, I should do more of that. It just feels great. I can't do it on the I can't do it on the um on the on the ride signal. So it doesn't feel right, but just something about that placement my oh, yeah. hat. So yeah, yeah, it's incredible. That's wonderful. Yeah, watching him play like that, where he's just swinging left to right like this, it just it, it you close your eyes and you you swear blind, you can feel it. Everything just feels the groove is just wonderful. Yeah, everything they recorded, um, you know, all those black and little black and white clips of them playing sort of on TV and uh, well, it's mostly they were mostly on TV actually. Oh, it's fantastic, and even that Hollywood Bowl, you know, where uh, Ringo said that they had to stop touring because he says, I "Couldn't hear myself." He says, "Everything just sounded shit," you know, it just sounded shit. But when right. you listen to it, it doesn't sound shit. It's, like, it's right on it, just right on it. He never dragged. And he didn't speed up either. It was just right on top of it. Loved it. So what are you working on these days? Um, are people sending you tracks? You're, you're doing all your own tracking at your own studio? I do some I do some remote stuff. Uh, not, not very much, to be honest with you. Um, during the whole lot, first lockdown, I made a lot of library music, sort of production music, which which is a lot of fun, actually, because it's it doesn't... It just, I, I just like doing stuff that I like doing so and if and if and if a library company wants to release it then that's great you know um, in fact the last one I did was a glam rock a glam rock album so we did a sort of bit of t-rex type feel so exploring all those all those drum sounds and just some Gary Glitter as well which didn't didn't name it as Gary Glitter which can't do that but uh, did some right. glitter, glitter band grooves and stuff like that it was fantastic yeah um, that was the whole of the lockdown first lockdown and then the second lockdown I sort of did a bit more and then by the end of it was sort of about 40 tracks recorded I thought oh, I've had enough of this you know so uh, <laughs> now that gigs have started coming in again it's good to play live um, so apart from that I'm just doing live music and um, a lot of practice which I've always done you play every day every day yeah yeah we'll always have done yeah uh, no actually no I always have no all, not always but I I have done in recent years, and it really, it really, really pays off. I don't want to ever be uh, guilty of being rusty and uh, and losing it. And I just feel that I'm kind of always building on what I what I had. So I won't let it go until until I retire. <laughs> so it's, thankfully, it's all working good right now. But you're a musician. Will you ever actually retire? Probably not. No. Yeah. No. But um, there comes a point where I suppose when you hit. I mean, I'm 69 now, so 70 next year. Um, how much longer are we? 80? Can be on 80? I'm not sure. There's not many drummers who make it that 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 far, and um, and don't end up sounding a bit embarrassing. Well, R Ringo would be what 82 now. Yeah, he doesn't play. You don't hear him playing much though, because he always has another drummer on stage with him. Yeah. yeah. Um, I don't know. I mean, I wouldn't. I mean, it, out of all the people that are 80 or 81, I mean, he's the most youthful looking 81 year old I think I've ever seen. I mean, he looks young, he looks younger than me, you know, and I'm 10 years younger than him. Um, right. It's incredible. It's just incredible. Um, but most, yeah, most drummers, this, the musculature is, doesn't keep up, you know. I won't name any names, but I've seen drummers that, who were my idols and they just, they, they, they sort of embarrass themselves by still carrying on doing. You know, sort of, it's a, yeah, it's a very vis physical job. Yeah, it's less physical for me now because um, I've sort of learned technique now. I didn't, I didn't have any technique when I, in my heyday. I just, just didn't have any. <laughs> just, it was all, <laughs> was, there was no sort of fine. Uh, well, I did develop some sort of fine work, but um, I, I've developed more. Um, well, I've actually developed how not to tire myself out. Right. As I, you know, like when I was in Cockney Rebel, I'd come off a tour with blisters all over my fingers. I'd have uh, sprained wrists, you know, t 
something wrong with my joints and sprained both two knees and two wrists all hurting because I'm just forcing it too hard and just ten- too much tension. I've, I've eliminated all that quite a few years ago, actually. Um, just got the tension out of my drumming, which, which kind of helps your creativity. So um, I think I'd probably last longer than I, if I'd have carried on like I was, then I'd probably be shot to pieces by now. You know, right. like singers who sort of sing from the throat, they end up losing it completely and they just, just they, you hear them years later and think, oh, that's, that's bad. Yeah, I understand. I mean, obviously a big part of performing live is performing, you know, and so I, I, I get it. You're, you're up there. There's all that adrenaline. You're going you're gonna to want to physically put on a performance as well as playing the parts. I mean, the visual yeah. aspects, I mean, we love it. Uh, yeah, I've never been in that type of drama. I don't do the big thing. Um, <laughs> you, don't do, you don't spin the sticks? <laughs> uh, I'm too scared if I drop them. <laughs> uh, that. that guy, that you know, that guy in that American band that played smart, dressed man. You know, the two bass drums with all the, yeah, all the yeah. American flags on. Have you seen him? Oh my yeah. goodness, he's a really good drummer. That guy, he sounds yeah. like you close your eyes and it's really rocking. But he's doing all these tricks around his head and everything. And, and <laughs> the just stays like that. It's like, oh man, that is that is proper muscular control and it's fantastic. I hope you enjoy that. Thank you, Stuart. Please check out the link to Hounds of Love by Kate Bush and, of course, Wuthering Heights to hear more about Stuart's incredible work on those wonderful albums.